Hello and welcome back to AP Environmental Science. Today I want to talk about water pollution. Uh, so ultimately the first thing that we need to decide is what is pollution and what can be polluted. Pollution is simply the degradation of some resource, right, um, or the environment. And so what can be polluted? Ultimately everything. When we think about pollution, we traditionally think about water pollution, air pollution, even ground, right, soil pollution. But don't forget that we can change the temperature of water, uh, we can change the climate, we add noise and light to the ecosystem, to the environment, and so really in the grand scheme of things everything can be degraded, so everything can be polluted, right? So when we start talking about where pollutants come from, we're going to be focusing on that air, water, and um, soil idea when we talk about where pollutants come from. There are two types of pollutants. There are point sources and there are non-point sources. So of the following, which would be the best example of a point source of water pollution? Well, the first thing that we have to do is decide what a point source is, and it's something that has an identifiable direct source, so factory effluent would be a point source. Stormwater, acid precipitation, agricultural runoff, any runoff actually, um, those are hard to locate where they actually come from specifically, so a point source is something that has an identifiable direct source, um, and so you can see in this case there are all these pipes, um, in this case, we can see we've got a fire, we've got a stack, right? Um, Any time where you can say this is the, the point. Now, in that question, I asked about, or I, I said effluent is one of the sources. Effluent is simply the output from a pipe or a source there, right? It's typically a fluid. In this case, it's a liquid in the picture here, okay? Another really good example of a point source, and, and you can come up with lots of examples on your own, but I'm just going to give you a couple. So we've got factory effluent, that's one source, or uh, one type. Another example would be leaky underground storage tanks, right? Underground storage tanks, which are abbreviated UST, um, have a tendency to leak, and when they leak, they will leak directly into the groundwater, and we will address in class when we are looking at putting all of this picture together, the water cycle and pollution, um, we'll look at groundwater pollution. Um, but believe it or not, there are millions of underground storage tanks, right? There's over a million of them. And about half a million of them uh, actually store gasoline, right, or other toxic substances. Um, and so this is a really big threat to groundwater when these things leak. So they have to be really well maintained. Okay, so let's shift to non-point sources. These are things that are occurring over large areas. They're diffuse, and so it's really difficult to determine the exact location. Uh, anything that's going to be runoff is going to be one of those those things, whether it's from a uh, crop, right, agricultural runoff, whether it's from feedlots, um, or whether it's from cities where you have the road runoff, things like that. So road runoff is the one that I'm going to focus on right now. And that is going to be anything that's coming off of an impervious surface, so that'll include parking lots as well. Um, when you talk about a parking lot, if you have a one acre parking lot compared to a one acre meadow, um, it's going to produce 16 times as much runoff and it's going to pick up everything that's on that surface. So what happens is that when you have more than 10% of a watershed covered by impervious surfaces, you're picking up lots and lots of pollutants that are going directly into the waterways, and so this is where you start having high levels of water pollution, uh, and you get things like nutrient loading, you get all the oil and gasoline that's on the road, any other thing that might have um, gone into the street for any reason, and then of course when you get high runoff, um, when that water's traveling through the streets, even when it's not traveling through the street anymore, it's still fast, and so it causes erosion and it picks up sediment. Now back to um, that kind of combination of surface water and groundwater, eventually sometimes that runoff can end up in uh, permeable areas, and so it's got all these pollutants in it. That is yet one more way that we get contaminants into groundwater. So we can pick it up in runoff, and then when it meets a permeable surface, 
it'll take all the pollutants down with it, the water will take all the pollutants down with it and end up in the aquifer too. So it's not just leaky underground storage tanks that contaminate groundwater, um, it's also surface waters can do that. Okay, um, and we've talked or we talk a lot in the course about surface water so I'm really highlighting groundwater in here because the majority of the water that we actually deal with especially when you're talking about city water is coming from aquifers okay and here's just a list of different ways that you can contaminate uh, groundwater all right so when we talk about contamination what are we really talking about so here is just a list of some of the major categories of water pollutants and I'm going to go through and talk about uh, each one of these a little bit and give you some more specific examples but here is sort of that overview concept map for you to look at okay so I'm going to start with toxic waste because when we think of pollutants we probably do think of your hazardous chemicals um, either synthetic or organic or inorganic right can also be natural inorganic or organic compounds but these are the things um, that are going to be the nasty chemicals right like the dirty dozen and all of those um, so this is going to include pesticides like DDT it's going to be your chlorine containing compounds um, like dioxin or PCB or things like that um, you're also going to include in here heavy metals right and heavy metals are going to be your leads your mercury right any of the cadmium right any of that stuff also something that is included in toxic waste is anything that's radioactive and we talk specifically about radioactive things when we talk about nuclear stuff okay so let's start with heavy metals um, probably the two big ones that you know are mercury and lead and mercury poisoning is a very big deal. Um, you actually get two routes of exposure to mercury. You've got methyl mercury, which is a water soluble version of it. Elemental mercury is a metal. You can see it here. It's this lovely liquid metal. It used to be in thermometers and things. Um, that you have to inhale, right? Typically is how you get your route to, uh, of exposure on elemental mercury. So when we talk about water pollution, we're actually talking about this methyl mercury, right? And so this is going to be the most common type of mercury poisoning, methyl mercury. So when you talk about eating sushi and getting a high uh, not condemning sushi, it is delicious, right? But the fatty fishes typically have more mercury in them. And so you typically want to limit your exposure to that. That is actually going to be methylmercury. Okay, it causes impaired neurologic development. It is especially bad in infants and children, um, also in fetuses. It's going to affect thinking, memory, attention, language, fine motor, and and visual spatial skills. Right. And so when you start looking for symptoms of mercury poisoning, you're going to have all of those things that go with having neurological impairment, right? So it could be um, kind of some of the same symptoms that you see in stroke, right? Difficulty with speech, difficulty walking, a muscle weakness. Um, it could also be a, like weird sensations that you get um, and some visual impairment, okay? Now, right, the most famous case of mercury poisoning and mercury poisoning is sometimes called Minamata disease. Um, this case was in a Japanese fishing village called Minamata, uh, and their water supply was poisoned by a company, unintentionally, by a company, right, that dumped methylmercury into the water supply. And there are still lawsuits from this. It happened um, from the 30s to the 60s, and there are still lawsuits that are going on in Japan right now because of all of the the damage that was done right to people now lead is the other one lead mostly affects kids and that's partly because kids eat random stuff right um, if you think about lead paint uh, things like that kids oftentimes eat playground dirt and there may be lead in that um, lead has gotten into the environment really two big routes leaded gasoline so when you burn leaded gasoline it put lead out into the air uh, and that caused a high volume of lead and then also it was in products right like lead paint yeah now it causes uh, stunting right hyperactivity it affects hearing and it can cause brain damage here's the thing about lead mercury is stored in fat right which is why you get it from eating fatty fishes yeah um, and it's in water yes lead is stored in bones 
right? And we'll talk about this. This is a very important difference in the way pollutants are stored in the body. Most pollutants bioaccumulate, right? Well, not most pollutants, but many pollutants bioaccumulate. Most of those that bioaccumulate will stay in fat and bioaccumulate means to be stored in the body and that's going to be in fat. This is really important because when you eat something, when another animal eats, so, so food chain, right, eats an, an organism that has bioaccumulated in fat, well that's now going to be stored in the next level up on the food web, right? So it's that same idea. If you eat sushi, you're going to eat not all sushi, but let's say that you have a nice big fatty piece of salmon. Um, there may be mercury in our tuna. There may be mercury in that. So when you eat that, it's now going to be stored in your fat, right? So lead is different because your body thinks that lead is calcium and it stores it in your bones instead of your fat. So while it does bioaccumulate, it doesn't biomagnify. It doesn't go up the food chain because most organisms don't eat, most predators for instance, don't eat bones, right? They just eat the muscle and, and fat. Okay. So that's a little bit about the difference between bioaccumulation and biomagnification. I'm going to talk about those more in here in just a minute. All right, so what are some other heavy metals? Arsenic, cadmium, zinc, aluminum, iron, and selenium. Now iron's on the list and that's interesting because you need iron, right? You need iron. If you don't have iron, that deficiency is called anemia. So you need a certain amount, but it goes back to the idea that too little of something, usually not good, but too much of something is also not good. Okay. Now here's the bioaccumulation by bio versus biomagnification. So I already talked about bioaccumulation. Let's talk about this biomagnification in detail. So I told you that if you're storing in fat or muscle, and typically it's going to be fat, that s something will eat a thing, right? So we've gotten in our little shrimp here, we've gotten mercury into their tissues right? So these fish eat these shrimp. They get that mercury that was in the shrimp into their tissues. Then this cute little seal eats these fish and it's got to eat more fish because it's bigger. So it will end up having more mercury in its tissues than each of the individual fish because it's going to magnify. This is a bigger animal. It needs more stuff. Then the polar bear is going to eat a lot of seals. The polar bear is bigger. So it's going to have a higher concentration of mercury. This is biomagnification. The older something is, the more it has eaten. So the more it will accumulate it will accumulate. Okay, so you've got two things happening. Size means you eat more stuff, so you get more pollutant. Age means you've eaten more stuff over time, so you've got more pollutant. So if you're really big and really old, right? So a big old polar bear would have lots and lots of pollutant stored in its fat. Okay? Now, all of the following are true about biomagnification, except concentrations of the toxins are lower in the environment than they are in food chains. The toxin must not be metabolized by organisms. Larger fish would tend to have larger concentrations of the toxins than smaller fish. Birds of prey have been particularly compromised by high concentrations of DDT, and the toxin must not be soluble in fat. Well, it turns out that one through four on this are true. One through four are true, okay? But five is false. The toxin does have to be soluble in fat, right? If it's not soluble in fats, then it won't bioaccumulate in, in the tissues that are going to be eaten through the food chain, okay? So it has to be soluble in fat. Lead does not biomagnify because it's stored in bones, okay? So let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about acid rain. Acid rain is where you have some chemical, right? Sulfur or nitrogen based. So typically we call these families um, SO2, SO3, NO2, NO. We call these families the soxes and the noxes and that's just because you have an X to represent however many oxygens you happen to have. Um, and so like this would be a nox. It could be NO or it could be NO2. Um, you might also see SOX, so noxes and soxes. When those get up into the atmosphere, right, the moisture in the atmosphere, the water mixes with the SOX or the NOx. And if it's a sulfur molecule, 
right? Then you're going to have sulfur containing molecule. Then you're going to make sulfuric acid. If it is a nitrogen containing molecule, you're going to make nitric acid, both of which are strong acids. So this is a real problem. They will dissociate, you will get ions, uh, and then when it rains, you will get acid rain. Okay. Atmospheric deposition of contaminants is an excellent example of the properties of water that allow it to disperse contaminants, a point source of pollution, a non-point source of pollution, the relative ease in determining the sources of contaminants, or a primary source of pollution. So atmospheric deposition is where you have um, pollutants raining or falling out of the atmosphere. Acid rain is a non-point pollution source. Acid rain is a non-point pollution source, right? Because it just falls out of the atmosphere. It's very hard to tell where the source is, but it definitely is really damaging. And here's just some pictures of forests that have been affected by acid rain because it lowers the pH. It's outside of the range of tolerance because you now have this acidification in the soil. Interestingly enough, um, when you get more acidic waters, you have more dissociation of metals. So when there are metals available in the water, the acid, the higher acidity, will actually result in metal poisoning of animals, right, that live in the water. So fish, basically, because you get those, as the rock dissolves in the acidic water, it releases all of the metals that are locked up in the rock, okay? Uh, and so that's kind of a big deal. But anyway, here is a big uh, sort of acid cycle. Make sure you look at this. Okay, and this is what I was talking about, about the acid shock, um, and you're releasing these metal ions. Aluminum happens to be one of those that gets released from rock a lot. Aluminum accumulates in fish gills and it suffocates them, and this is called aluminum toxicity, um, and they will suffocate to death because of the higher aluminum levels in the water. The higher aluminum levels in the water are due to acid shock, right, which is an increase in... Um, a decrease rather in pH. Okay, so when you start having acid deposition into aquatic systems, it's changing the pH and you actually get a change in what kinds of organisms will live there. Um, trout are a really good indicator of how things are going in terms of the health of the ecosystem because trout have relatively narrow ranges of tolerance and so once they drop below a certain pH and you can consider stuff acidic when it's below 4.5 like it's acidic at 4.5 um, and then it's like really acidic at 4 or lower and that's when you start to see your trout disappear. Now once you start seeing species disappear, and we talk about this when we talk about uh, ecosystems, but once you start seeing these fish disappear, you're going to start to see a transition into what we call undesirable species and a change in the ecosystem overall. Okay, and of course acid rain really has an impact on us and our structures because as this acidic water is pouring out of the sky, it's running over our buildings and our statues and all of the things that we have there and it's eating them away. Acid rain dissolves stuff. So here you can't even tell that this used to be a statue of a woman. It's just eaten away by acid rain. And the black layer on it is other pollutants that um, we can talk about when we talk about air pollution. All right, let's talk about nutrients, right? How can nutrients be bad? That sounds crazy, but remember, too little, too much. So our nutrients are nitrogen and phosphorus. Oh, hey, we talked about nitrogen when we were talking about acid rain. So our noxes in the atmosphere make acid rain, but ammonium and nitrate are great fertilizers. Okay, ammonium and nitrate are fertilizers. Yeah, phosphorus is in some waste, but mostly it's a product of soap, right? So let's say that you're washing your car or something like that, and you get phosphorus into the waterway. Um, phosphorus is a limiting factor in ecosystems, by the way, right? Phosphorus is something that everybody needs. It's what you build your DNA backbone with, well, RNA, DNA backbone. Um, so you need phosphorus. It is the limiting factor in ecosystems. So you do need some, but more is bad. It leads to something called eutrophication. And eutrophication is an excess growth of algae. 
right? It's an excess growth of algae. And while that doesn't seem like a bad thing, and there are natural um, types of eutrophication, right? Eutrophication actually occurs in some waterways naturally. It's a natural thing. But the ecosystem is built around that eutrophication if it's a natural thing. We're concerned about when we dump extra nutrients into the water and we end up causing eutrophication, this um, excess Al algal growth. Okay. Now we're going to tie in nutrients to oxygen demanding waste. So even though these are two different categories, they come together because um, the process of eutrophication is you get nutrients in the water, you get aquatic plants explode, and that's great, right? Because there's lots of oxygen, wonderful, except it's not really that wonderful because um, you're changing the ecosystem because you're changing the species in it, which is a different conversation. But, but as you increase this algae, um, a couple of things happen. One, light is actually reduced because it can't get through the algae. And so you have plants that are deeper start losing this access to light and then they start to die. The other thing that happens is this boom, right? Well, they die too. And so you may constantly get new little plants, but the older plants die. And so you have submerged vegetation is dying. The excess production of algae, they start to die. And when they start to die, they are going to be decomposed. They're going to be decomposed by decomposers. A lot of those decomposers are bacteria, right? Um, so you get two things happening. As the plants start to be decomposed by bacteria, the bacteria use lots and lots of oxygen. This is the ox oxygen demanding waste. So um, bacteria and other things that use lots of oxygen, that's your oxygen demanding, that's your oxygen demand there. Okay. The amount of oxygen that's used for bacterial comp decomposition is called BOD, or biological oxygen demand. If this is really high, it means you have a lot of decaying organic matter in the water, but it really reduces the amount of oxygen that is available in the water for other things like fish. Yeah, So they die because they lose the oxygen to the bacteria. Now you also have a decrease in oxygen because we just said that you killed all those submerged plants who were providing oxygen at lower levels in the body of water. So, so think about the fact that water is deeper and the algae at the top are only making oxygen at the top. Unless there's mixing of water, there's no reason for it to be deeper because that water at the top is warmer, it stays at the top, and so you really lose all of the oxygen dissolved in the water at the lower levels. Okay, You may have a lot of oxygen in the water at the top, but not at the bottom. That is eutrophication. Okay, So high oxygen content in water is an indication that there's a large population of coliform bacteria. There are no contaminants present at all. The water is clean enough to support game fish. Water is only able to support algae and bacteria, or sewage, paper pulp, or food processing waste have been added to the water. If you have high oxygen, it means you don't have the bacteria right? You have a normal amount of bacteria. Um, it may or may not mean that there are contaminants. You can't really make a decision on that one because not all contaminants affect water. Um, if you have a lot of oxygen, it can support a lot of stuff and you haven't put in nutrients or oxygen demanding waste. Okay, so when you have high oxygen content, you have a healthy fish population and that is great, right? So three is the answer to this one. So when you put organic waste into it, this is your nitrogen phosphorus sources, um, what you see is you may have high oxygen concentration, but once you get that waste in the water, you start to have eutrophication, or at the very least, you start to have lots of bacteria, you get an oxygen sag, and then as that waste is dealt with, you might end up having um, cleaner water further downstream, but in this oxygen sag, you're going to end up with fish kills and all sorts of bad things going on. Okay, Now, why does it matter if you don't have oxygen? Well, one, you, you can't have fish without oxygen. But the products that you get from decomposition also change. When you have aerobic conditions, you get CO2. Decaying matter 
releases CO2, it releases nitrate, you get sulfate, you get phosphate. These are all things that can be taken up by plants. They are healthy nutrients, they're healthy for the plants, they can use them. When you have anaerobic conditions, you end up getting um, methane, you end up getting ammonia, you end up getting hydrogen sulfide, okay? These are all toxic, and so now you've actually added toxic things into the water, all right? Actually, methane is not toxic, it just can't be used, but it is a greenhouse gas, and we'll, we can talk about that when we talk about greenhouse gases. All right, shifting gears, our next category is pathogenic microbes. So here we just talked about bacteria um, that are decomposers, but there are other microbes in your water too, and those may be pathogenic, right? Pathogenic means that they cause disease, and billions of people around the world are exposed to waterborne diseases. This is especially true in your least developed countries, but outbreaks do occur in developed countries. We see them all the time. Um, Dallas actually had a big uh, cryptosporidiosis outbreak in the Dal in Dallas, sorry, Dallas had one here in 2008. There we go, that's an actual sentence. Um, and not all of these are going to be bacteria. Some of them are little single-celled guys. Um, some of them are fungi, actually. So a microbe is just something that's really tiny. Um, and the other thing that happens is that the risk of epidemic of waterborne diseases always increases during natural disasters, things like earthquakes, floods, and hurricanes. It is hurricane season, and so hurricanes really can cause um, serious environmental issues, not just not just waterborne diseases, and this is something we discuss in class. Okay, the diseases that are caused by water pollution in the major cities of developing countries are mainly due to the lack of waste treatment systems to accommodate the population, the high amount of runoff that includes pesticides, fertilizers, and animal waste, the high number of industries that dump their waste into the surface water, the practice of swimming in water contaminated by toxic chemicals, and the high use of pesticide and fertilizers by urban residents. All of these things do contribute to water pollution. They're all things that happen. The thing, though, that relates directly to disease is going to be waste treatment. Okay, it's going to be waste treatment. So the lack of waste treatment systems to accommodate the population is the number one contributor to waterborne diseases anywhere, actually, but into the developing world. Yeah. So a follow-up question is, if you have high levels of fecal, corn col fecal coliform bacteria in a water source, what does that indicate about it? Is it safe to drink? It's been contaminated by untreated human or animal waste. It's safe to swim in. It contains too little oxygen to support fish lice life. Uh, it has recently been chlorinated at a sewage treatment plant. Well, bacteria, there's bacteria in water. Um, but fecal coliform bacteria is associated with waste, right? Fecal coliform bacteria is associated with waste. So when you start talking about fecal coliform, it's not safe to drink, it's not safe to swim in, uh, it may or may not contain too little oxygen, you don't really know, that may be caused by something else, it's definitely not been chlorinated, it definitely has human or animal waste in it. Okay, fecal coliform in itself is actually not pathogen pathogenic, um, but it does indicate that you have other bacteria. So if you look at these, uh, feces, sewage, sewage, feces, sewage, 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 right? These are all things that show up in contaminated water that's contaminated with feces, right? Sewage, waste, yeah? These are indicated by fecal coliform. So we look for fecal coliform, and again, sewage, feces, right? Um, we look for fecal coliform to find these things, and you'll notice um, there were bacteria on the other slide, viruses, protozoa, right? There's your cryptosporidium. This is what causes cryptosporidiosis. Um, giardia, you've probably heard about that. Toxoplasma, toxoplasmosis. This is what you get out of your kitty box. This actually is not a water pollutant, by the way. Um, Toxoplasmosis you get from your kitty box, right? Anyway, and then, ooh, worms, yay. Everybody loves worms. Okay, 
Let's shift to sediment now. Okay, sediment is exactly what it sounds like. It's just sediment. So why is it a problem? There's sediment in lots of places. Well, again, it goes back to like the nutrient idea. If you're putting more of something in a system than there should be, it's going to cause problems. And so sediment pollution can be caused by runoff that causes erosion. It can be caused by floods, mud flows. Some of those are human caused, right? It is definitely the greatest pollutant by volume. Um, it's usually like it, it's not going to relate to toxicity but what it is going to do is it's going to change the quality of the water it makes it more turbid right or opaque it's less clear and so this is going to start killing off plants at the bottom because you don't get enough light um, it's going to sometimes clog up gills right if the sediment's really fine it is definitely going to settle in the pores between um, gravel right it's going to settle in there and that actually prevents um, eggs from being laid in gravel so a lot of times fish or other things um, little invertebrates will lay eggs in in between the pores of gravel or in the dirt and the sediment fills that in and so now you can't actually have reproduction of these organisms in there because now the eggs are just on the surface and that may not work for them so sediment pollution is a problem. And then the last pollution we want to talk about is thermal pollution. And this is just the artificial heating of waters. Um, basically what happens is that hot, hotter water can hold less oxygen. Okay, And so you get less dissolved oxygen. That means fish don't do as well. right? The other thing is you may heat it up past um, species ranges of tolerance and so if it gets too hot they will either migrate or they will die out and so you start losing species in the ecosystem and when you lose species in the ecosystem it changes the whole system so less oxygen and may exceed ranges of tolerance okay so last thing we want to talk about really quickly are the four things that you need to know in terms of water legislation the number one is the Clean Water Act of 1972 its goal is to create fishable swimmable waterways it sets quality water quality standards okay water quality standards um, for waterways um, this is after the Water Quality Act the Water Quality Act is about drink is really kind of about drinking water okay um, it's basically that that there should be established water purity standards that you should have an administration that oversees water pollution okay so this is about having safe water the Clean Water Act extends it to waterways yeah you also have the Safe Drinking Water Act. This is what actually sets the specific standards for municipal water treatment centers, um, systems. Sorry. So if you go back and look at the Water Quality Act, this is we should have we should have good healthy water, right? Clean Water Act is like uh, surface waters. Safe Drinking Water Act is the stuff that comes out of your tap and also your groundwater and then the last piece of legislation is the ocean dumping ban and this ties in together ocean pollution and water quality and it prevents um, anyone from dumping sewage or industrial waste into the water it doesn't govern trash just sewage sludge and industrial waste all right and then who owns the water this is not something we're going to talk about a lot um, but everybody has access to groundwater anyone who touches a stream lake or river has access to it um, you can also buy water rights from publicly owned waters or um, from people who own river rights and then there's the question of like if we're both on the river who has the most right to it and that's usually a sort of court kind of decided thing um, okay that is it I know it was a lot of stuff it was a little bit longer than I usually like but thank you for listening if you have any questions please ask me in class and I will see you next time